Hello, church. So great to see you, whether you're here in the North Sanctuary, the South Sanctuary, our awesome Speedway campus where I got news that the ladies got together for a bunco party. You're having too much fun. Get right with the Lord, wet Speedway, that's for sure. And always to our, our online uh, viewers, a particular shout out to Irene today, who's watching from Grand Prairie, Texas, because her son Caleb, who rocked it today, was in the choir. Let's give it up for Irene and all those who are watching online. We love having you with us. This last Monday, January the 21st, was my birthday. Yeah, I feel the same way. But did you also know that uh, last Monday, January the 21st, is also considered the saddest day of the year? Did you notice that? It's true. A UK psychologist has dubbed it as Blue Monday which is not how I felt at all. Matter of fact, if you're on social media following us, you may have saw how the, my pastor buddies here at Westside joined me in my happy birthday, happy dance. Take a look on the screen if you missed it. Here we go. Ready? Yeah. 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 Well, that's how I felt for sure. Oh, this last Monday. Um, it turns out it's not January 21st that's Blue Monday. It is the third Monday of the year of the month of January. It's the third Monday. A psychologist by the name of Dr. Arnold uh, created an equation, an algorithm. We're going to put it on the screen to determine this date. First of all, it's the weather uh, plus uh, the amount of debt you gained from the holidays <laughs> minus your debt. Uh, the discretionary income to pay it off times uh, the amount of uh, time that's elapsed since Christmas divided by your motivation of having to go back to work times the amount of time it's taken you to break your New Year's resolution. <laughs> And, you know, basically, apart from the weather and the seasonal affective disorder, you know, all of these things are about setting priorities and the discipline to see them through. So I'm going to ask you a couple questions and you get to figure in your mind the percentage, okay? The first one is, what percentage of New Year's resolutions fail by the second week of February? Got a percentage in your mind? Uh, the answer is... 80%. Wow. Second question is, what percentage of people actually succeed in fulfilling their New Year's resolution by the end of the year? You got it? Uh, the answer is 8%. So what some of you have creatively done, if you decided you're not going to set any New Year's resolution, and your logic is it, you can never fail if you never set a goal to begin with. The idea is you aim at nothing, you most certainly hit it. I'm not sure that that isn't ultimately a great solution. So our key idea today, we're going to build this whole service around this key idea. And Jesus, as we're, as we're going to see in our teaching today, was really actually big on the idea of setting priorities and setting goals. Our key idea really expresses it well. If you brought a Believe book with you, it's found on page 225. I invite you to memorize this big key idea. Say it out loud with me. Ready? I focus on God and his priorities for my life. Now, for Jesus, it wasn't just about having priorities. For Jesus, it was all about having the right Priorities. The definition of a priority, I looked it up, is a thing that is regarded as more important than another. A priority forms a decision-making grid for you so that when you are faced with a decision, your priority wins out in the decision every single time. And that's what this key door is all about today that we desire to unlock. It is the a spiritual practice called single-mindedness. And we're going to unlock that door today and invite you to walk through it. And if you walk through it, you're going to experience this God brand of success in your life if you're interested in it. So that's what we're going to talk about today. Now, embedded in our key verse that supports this key idea is found in Matthew chapter 6, verse 33, something else I'm going to invite you to memorize, or on page 225 of your Believe book, is the secret sauce or the alternate algorithm from the lips of Jesus. In the context of Matthew chapter 6, Jesus is teaching us not to worry. 
He is saying to us that we do not need to worry. We worry about things like our health, where the next meal's coming from, paying the bills, having enough clothes for our kids to wear and shoes. But the list of what we worry about, what we let occupy our mind, is a much greater than that. Uh, we, we worry about not being accepted, the fear of, not, uh, of being alone, the fear of the unknown, the fear of losing. And Jesus comes to us in this passage and he teaches us that we should not worry because worry doesn't fundamentally change the circumstances that you're worrying about. As a matter of fact, it oftentimes makes it worse because it creates internal stress, which releases toxicity in you, and you've taken something that you're worrying about, and now you've got something else to worry about. It's called ulcers. So Jesus encourages not to worry. The question is, how do you do that? And he gives us the answer in our key verse today. I invite you to memorize Matthew 6, 33. Say it out loud with me. But seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. The invite is to make God and his kingdom your number one priority. So that when you are faced with the decision, when you're engaged in the practice of making a decision, you will put God and his word first. And Jesus said, if you will have the courage to do that, I promise you, everything's going to be okay. Everything's going to turn out okay for you. I love the way C.S. Lewis paraphrased the teaching of Jesus here. He put it in a formula. Take a look at this. Put first things first, and we get second things thrown in. Put second things first, and we lose both first and second things. I want to unpack that a little bit by giving you four profiles of single-mindedness in three characters in the scripture. The first two come from the life of Peter, who had a really close relationship with Jesus. The first guy story is found on page 233 of your Believe book, or if you brought your Bible, you can turn to Matthew chapter 14. The story begins in verse 22. After Jesus has just fed 5,000 people with just five loaves and two fishes, he invites the disciples to go ahead of him across the Sea of Galilee in a boat, and he would catch up with them on the other side later. And as the disciples are on the boat, and nightfall has set in, and morning is beginning to come, a violent storm breaks out, tossing the boat back and forth all over the place. Now look what happens next. Shortly before dawn, Jesus went out to them walking on the lake. <laughs> Can you imagine that? When the disciples saw him walking on the lake, they were terrified. It's a ghost, they said, and cried out in fear. But Jesus immediately said to them, take courage. It is I. Don't be afraid. There it is again. Lord, if it's you, Peter replied, tell me to come out to you on the water. Come, Jesus said. Come on. Then Peter got down out of the boat, walked on the water, and came toward Jesus. <laughs> but when he saw the wind, he was afraid and began to sink. He cried out, Lord, save me. Immediately, Jesus reached out his hand and caught him. You of little faith, he said, why did you doubt? When Peter's eyes were fixed Firmly on Jesus, he rose above his circumstances and walked on water. The minute that Peter turns to the right and turns to the left and begins to focus on the wind and the waves, he begins to sink like a man wearing concrete shoes. If you're writing uh, notes, write down this application. When you are in the middle of a storm... Circumstances. Focus on the one who can save you, not the waves and the wind. Think about the circumstances maybe you're in right now. I mean, some of you uh, have in your life maybe got the news that it might be cancer. 
Uh, I had that happen to me a couple of years ago, went in for a, a, a physical and they found a nodule on my thyroid. They did a needle biopsy. It came out inconclusive. And so they encouraged me to go and have the surgery to take it out. And I immediately went into panic and worry mode. Oh yeah, that helped a lot, right? It doesn't change anything of the situation at all. But I find that whenever you fix your eyes on Jesus, and not the potential of cancer, the wind and the waves. Oh man, it gives you great strength to rise above the circumstances. It turned out it was benign, but boy, did I learn a lesson about not worrying. Amen? Maybe it's uh, losing a job. I've lost a job before. Immediately, panic mode. Oh yeah, that's gonna help the situation a lot. The idea is to fix your eyes on Jesus and you will discover that you too can walk on water. It actually is true. Now, the second illustration comes from the life of Peter as well, when he faced a very tough decision. And we see that Peter grew as a Christ follower from his boat experience with Jesus. I've included the story on page 234 of your Believe book. It's also found in the book of Acts in the New Testament, chapter 5. Peter's in Jerusalem with the other apostles, and they are getting it done. They are fully focused on God and his kingdom. They are spreading the good news and people are coming to Christ by the thousands. And the Jewish religious leaders are jealous and they decide to take Peter and the apostles and to throw them into jail. Now, I've never been in jail, but I can tell you that being in jail would scare the bejeebies out of me. I would begin to worry and I would begin to question whether or not I was going to be so strong in my declaration of the gospel of Jesus Christ. I mean, I'm just being totally honest with you, right? So that night, an angel comes into the jail and breaks Peter and the apostles out of the jail. And before they leave, he says to them, now I want you to go back to the temple again, and this is what he says, and tell the people all about this new life. So that's exactly what they do. They, the next day, the authorities found them preaching um, in the open, and they brought Peter and the apostles back in, and they questioned them, and they said, we gave you strict orders not to teach in this name. Decision-making time. Decision-making time. I want you to look at the bottom of the page and see what they decided. Peter said to them, we must obey God rather than human beings. This is single-mindedness. It is a priority. And whenever he was faced with a tough decision, the priority won out. This is what it's all about. So the religious leaders got furious, as you might suspect, and they wanted to kill him. But there was an honored teacher among them by the name of Gamaliel. Historians tell us this is the man who taught Paul before he became a Christian. And he spoke up and gave this incredible piece of truth found in Acts chapter 5 or page 235 of your Believe book. He says, therefore, in the present case, I advise you, leave these men alone. For if their purpose or activity is of human origin, it will fail. But if it is from God, you will not be able to stop these men. You will only find yourself fighting against God. Mm. If, you, if what you are doing, God is involved in it, you will win every single time. Peter got it. And he changed his point of view and he grew. And that gives hope for me when I face tough decisions. Will I have the courage to live out my priorities, knowing that when I am focused on God and his kingdom, at the end, I win every single time. In order to do that, you have to trust the one you're focused on, do you? <laughs> Here's the application. When you are faced with a tough decision, choose God. Choose God. I double dog dare you. The third example comes from a lesser known story in the Old Testament. Maybe you read it this week in the Believe book. It's one of my favorite. It's a guy named King Jehoshaphat. He is the king of the southern uh, uh, kingdom of Judah. And in the story, three, not one, but three armies allied together to come up against 
him and his people, and he is flat out overwhelmed. But in the midst of this battle, he makes a declaration found on page 230 of your Believe book or 2 Chronicles chapter 20 in verse 12. This is what he says. For we have no power to face this vast army that is attacking us. We do not know what to do, but our eyes are on you. That's single-mindedness courageous single-mindedness and instructing the people to keep their eyes focused on God, they were able to receive direction from God and essentially walk on water. They conquered over their enemy without lifting a finger. The only thing that Jehoshaphat instructed the people to do is to put the choir people who could carry a tune in the front of the soldiers as they marched into the battlefield and to sing a song. I mean, I'm imagining like if it were today, it'd be like, sing onward Christian soldiers, onward Christian soldiers. And if I were the singer being put in the front of the battle line, I would have said, listen, I can carry a tune, but I was wondering, are there any bazookas available? (laughs) Don't need a bazooka. When God is in it, you will win. C.S. Lewis told us this from the teaching of Jesus, and this is what happened. When they put first things first, that is, they put God first, they had God on their side, but second things were thrown in. Not only did they win the battle, but the story tells us it took them three days to collect all the plunder from the three armies. That's how single-mindedness in God works. Not only for King Jehoshaphat, but also for you. If you're writing down your applications, write this down. When you are in an unavoidable and necessary battle, that is with people, get your marching orders from God. So right now, think of maybe the conflicts that you're in with people, the battle, maybe people attacking you, people who are not for you. And your fleshly instinct is to sort of retaliate in your flesh. Maybe some of you are going through a nasty divorce right now. I am super sorry. My biggest recommendation after watching this happen as a pastor for over 30 years, don't fight back in the flesh, but rather go to God and say, God, as I focus on you, what is my next move? And I think you're going to find a different outcome than you have expected. The final example comes in an unexpected place. I want to focus our attention on the story of the Magi and and the birth of Jesus. This is a beautiful story of single-mindedness. The Magi uh, were wise men who came from afar for the purpose of focusing their worship on Jesus when he was a baby. The basic storyline is not in your belief book, but it is found in the Gospel of Matthew chapter 2. Look at what it says in verse 1. After Jesus was born in Bethlehem in Judea during the time of King Herod, Magi from the east came to Jerusalem and asked, Where is the one who has been born the king of the Jews? We saw his star when it rose and have come to worship him. The Magi, also known as wise men, came from afar. Likely they came from the east in Persia. And they were astrologers and navigators. And as navigators, they used the stars and the planets to determine where they were at and where they wanted to go. So they would fix their bearings, in this case, single-mindedly on that star, and they began to walk towards it. Now, I have a a good friend who is a a retired Air Force uh, navigator, and he taught me an important principle that translates to us today in navigation called the one in 60 rule. And in navigation, the rule goes like this, if you wanna draw this on your sheet. If you wanna travel uh, 60 miles, okay, 60 miles, and you set your compass, but you drift just 1% off course, by the time you come to the end of the 60 miles, you will be one mile off your desired destination. The Magi traveled an estimated 1,000 1, miles, and so if you use the one in 60 rule, if they were just even one degree off from traveling 1,000 miles, they would have missed the house of Jesus by 17 miles. 
And the same thing is true for us. When we get our focus off just a little bit bit on one day, just one degree off, over time, we find ourselves lost. One day you decide that you're not going to come to church. Maybe a little snow on the ground. (laughs) I'm just going to get a little personal here. I've been a bit surprised about some of you coming from San Antonio. You're wimps. You know, I'm just, you know, you want to meet me out at the back? I'm fine with that. I grew up in East Cleveland. Just keep that in mind. I got a mean left hook, right? And God's on my side, so. So you make a decision. You're going to miss church. You know, I don't want you to feel guilty about that. Church is more than just coming to a building, but it's more about, the, about keeping yourself focused. Or maybe it's reading the Bible, or maybe it's being in a small group or praying. You know, not to make you feel guilty about that. Now, this is not about feeling guilty. This is about keeping your focus on Christ. And you just get a little bit off thinking it's not going to matter. And then one day you wake up, and you are 17 spiritual miles away from God. Let the Magi's teach you this application. Write it down. When you need direction, fix your eyes on Jesus. That's good stuff. Now, if you are new to Westside, you may not know this, but if you've been around a long time, uh, there has been a lot of transitioning going on here at Westside. You know, I'm one of them, you know. Uh, <laughs> You know, there's been a lot of a lot of transition. And as a general rule, we don't like change, right? How many Christians does it take to change a light bulb? Change? Who said anything about change? You know? And so there's been a lot of transition, but I want to talk to you about it and use it as an example of what we're talking about today. Uh, All of the transitions we've experienced over the last year have been personnel transitions. And every one of those transitions have been good. And they have been blessed. I've seen it before. I've seen it again. God puts a deep vision into somebody, a holy discontent, a calling, and they've just got to do it. And our goal is not to hold them in a cage, but rather is to release them and to bless them. And that's what happened. You know? Can we talk about the elephant in the room? I mean, um, first of all, Dan Sutherland. Let's talk about that for a minute, okay? I've known Dan Sutherland longer than anyone else in this room. I've known Dan for over 20 years. We are really good friends. And Dan loves church planning. And Dan, in the month of March, is going to plan a church about seven minutes away from us. Ooh. Here's the reality. Here's the reality. If Dan Sutherland were standing here and the goal was to try to find another person exactly the opposite of him, I just might be a candidate. (laughs) And you know what the good news about that is? Is that it is all about seeing people in this lifetime come to know Jesus so they can spend an eternity with Jesus. This is what it's all about. And there are some things, there are some people that Dan Sutherland can reach that I can't. And there are some people I can reach that Dan can't. So we are just partnering together because there are people that are not going to be with Jesus unless something changes today or tomorrow or in the near future. And we're going to see that happen by the diversity of churches that are coming together. Amen? Let's talk about KC Underground. Some of you don't know what that is, but we just recently blessed I mean, a big way, Rob Wagner and Brian Johnson to start Casey Underground. Just before the first service, uh, Rob texted me and said, hey, I'm praying for you. They've got their first big meeting tonight. And I said, man, I'm rooting for you. What they're doing is very different than what we're doing at Westside. And as a result, the kingdom might actually grow. And you know what we say about that? Yay, God. Amen? Now... With that said, while there's a lot of good transitions going, because that's what God does, he stirs it up, right? So that his kingdom might expand. There are some things that are not changing here. And that is the fundamental mission of this church. I want to put it up on the screen and I want you to see it. It is loving Jesus, becoming like Jesus and sharing Jesus. Say it with me. Loving Jesus, becoming like Jesus, and sharing. A mission statement with seven words, and three of them are Jesus. 
I mean, we have got our laser beam on Jesus. And you know why? Because as long as our laser beams on Jesus, everything's going to be okay. We will continue to walk on water. And that expresses why this church has had the hand of God's blessing on it. I plan to keep. Now you can clap. Now you can clap. <laughs> In addition to the single-minded mission, our values are not changing. The supremacy of Jesus, the authority of Scripture, which I taught last week, the importance of making disciples, the importance of reaching the spiritual orphan, the person far from God, the importance of the physical orphan based upon the commands of Jesus and his brother James, and certainly for me, a big passion for the Big C Church, whether it is, um, it, it is Restore Shawnee, the work of Dan Sutherland, or whether it is KC Underground, the work of Rob Wagner, or whether it is a project that we're working on for this next fall, I can't wait to tell you, we're through the work of Westside, a hundred different churches are coming together to do something super exciting. You're just going to have to wait to find out what it is. But we are organizing churches of so many different denominations, you're not even going to believe it. And listen to this. This last week, I got a call from a brand new friend of mine by the name of Pastor John Brooks. He is the pastor of Macedonia Baptist Church in KC Mo, and we have become buds. We, have be we are brothers from another mother, a very solid African-American church, and we are coming together to tear it up for Jesus. And if we get thrown in prison like the apostle Peter and others, we're going to continue to proclaim his name. This Saturday, uh, we're going to join our staff and their staff, and we're going to go together to this uh, wonderful play uh, called Underground on the Underground Railroad, where white people and black people got together to do what was right. We're going to have a conversation about it and we're going to sit together and we're going to tear down any barriers that exist not only for this event but in the days to come he's in on the event for next fall and we're going to see the name of Jesus spread throughout Kansas City like never before can I get an amen for that lots of change it's all good but there are some things that are never changing and that is the undeniable laser beam focus on Jesus Christ not only is that good for your church but that is good for your life I dare you dare you to try it on so that's what this single-mindedness door is all about and today we've tried to take the scriptures and we've tried to unlock this door for you say it with me church ready I focus on God and his priorities for my life now you got to walk through it in order for it to work. You have to practice it. And I believe that if you do come the third Monday of next January, or any day for that matter, you just might break out in your happy dance. Come on. And all of God's people said, amen. Well, I thought you were going to say stop it, but I like amen better. Would you stand to your feet? Uh, I'm going to ask our prayer partners if they would come down and be available in this service in our South Sanctuary, our Speedway campus. Our folks online are ready to pray for you. They're going to come down right now. And uh, maybe uh, today uh, you have, you're off just one degree, but it didn't just start today. It started quite a while ago, and you've kind of drifted, and, uh, and you need to get back. These people would love to pray for you. Or maybe you're saying, Randy, I'm not just drifting, man. I am pointed in the opposite direction. Maybe today is the day you decide to come to Christ for the very first time, give your life over to him, receive the forgiveness of sins, become a Christian. I mean, you know, this would be awesome. They would love to tell you about how to do that. Don't be afraid. Come to Christ and enter into this new life, the angel said. Or maybe some of you are carrying a tremendous amount of worry. This is what really instituted this whole conversation with Jesus to begin with. You're carrying a worry, a burden, and this worry is just making the situation worse. And you need to get your focus on Jesus. And these people would love for you to, uh, to pray for you to leave that burden with him and maybe walk on water a little bit this week. Amen? Now go into the world in peace. Have courage. Hold on to what is good. Honor all people. Strengthen the faint-hearted. Support the weak. Help the suffering and share the gospel. Love and serve the Lord and the power of the Holy Spirit. And may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Amen. Have a great day, church.